<clears throat> okay, hello. Um, uh, today is May 30th, uh, 2023, and we'll talk about two architects, two very important architects. Um, we'll start with uh, Junso Sakakura uh, from Japan, and uh, let's, uh, let's read a little bit about him. Sakakura uh, was born, uh, was, uh, as I said, he was born on the 30th of um, uh, May, if I'm not mistaken. Here I see the, 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 the precise date, the day is not shown. Was a Japanese architect and former president of the Architectural Association of Japan. After graduating from university, he worked in Le Corbusier's Atelier in Paris. He rose to the position of studio, studio chief during his seven years' stay in the studio. Not bad, so he worked with Le Corbusier for seven years. He formed his own practice on his return to Japan, becoming an important member of the modernist movement. In 1959, he collaborated with Le Corbusier on the National Museum of Western Art in Tokyo, which was the only um, work that uh, Le Corbusier uh, built in, in, in Japan. So here we see a picture of uh, both, both of them, both with uh, bow ties showing, uh, you know, a certain uh, dignified uh, face of uh, what architects can be about. So here we see a picture of um, Sakakura and Charlotte Perion, an important collaborator of uh, Le Corbusier. Uh, I don't know where this picture was taken. Uh, it seems he was not so young any longer or anyway, who knows, maybe in France, maybe in Japan. So on the left, Charlotte Perion. Uh, please remember her name because she was a, a very interesting uh, architect and designer who had some difficulties with uh, Le Corbusier, da, but uh, in the end, uh, uh, I think uh, the master appreciated her and it's a good thing he did. Uh, okay, moving forward here, we see again, uh, uh, you know, uh, Sakakura is in the back and Le Corbusier, uh, and I don't know who the other uh, people are. Uh, Le Corbusier was very appreciated in Japan and not only in Japan. I read actually that uh, when he searched for a job for Le Corbusier Sakakura, uh, Le Corbusier recommended him to take, take some courses in architecture and construction uh, in Paris, and he did for about six months. But this is a little bit <laughs> ironical almost because it's well known and documented the fact that Le Corbusier hated schools, but <laughs> maybe the other side of him appreciated them and that's why he sent Sakakura to study for six months. Now, the Pavilion of Japan, uh, the ex exhibition, uh, the Universal Exhibition, World's Exhibition from 1937. Um, you see, 1937, this was before the Second World War, and it's a very, you know, modernistic um, structure. 1937. Maybe today it doesn't look so um, freshly modern, but uh, at that time, you can imagine. Uh, I read that actually uh, Sakakura was very influenced by Villa Savoie and uh, uh, the pavilion, the Le Corbusier pavilion built in, uh, in Zurich, in, in Switzerland. Maybe he even collaborated on those works with um, uh, Le Corbusier. It seems that Le Corbusier did have uh, an important influence on um, important architects, future important architects, like uh, yesterday we talked about Yanis Xenakis, today we talk about um, Sakakura. So I guess it pays to be in the proximity of, a, you know, maybe we don't exaggerate too much if we say a formidable architect and cultural figure, an artist and provocateur, Le Corbusier. But this building is not bad by, uh, by Sakakura at all. Residence of uh, Taro Okamoto, also uh, uh, by Sakakura. And this is rather 
unexpected now uh, it's it's almost exotic uh, this was i think um, uh, an important uh, japanese um, artist and this is the residence i don't know when it, this was built by sakakura unfortunately i don't have here the uh, the year when it was built but uh, actually when i look at this elevation towards the street i'm thinking that it's very possible to do a very engaging and interesting architecture where the the front elevation uh, uh, is actually could be blank just like is this with an emblem uh, or some kind of base relief or um, a sculptural treatment of the of the elevation just like it is here now of course this is an artist studio so and museum so you know in this case is more appropriate but even if you build for, a, let's say, an accountant, you can express something in the elevation, a narration uh, connecting, uh, you know, the, the preoccupations, the, the, you know, the, the life of, of the owner with uh, the architectural expression. For example, if this building was built by, for, a, for an accountant, what would you do to express the fact that it was an accountant living in that house? You know, and, and, and I think there is a great potential in a narrative architecture. And here we do have a narrative architecture. The, the, the facade is telling you something about what you are going to see inside the building. And that is the artworks of this um, uh, artist, Tarot. And here we see, you know, artworks by, by the artist. I do think it's, it's, it's probably very beneficial to reflect on the possibility of a narrative architecture. Because I think most of the time we just, you know, design or build, uh, uh, make a project for a building that is maybe correct functionally, maybe pleasing aesthetically, but it doesn't say anything about the characteristics of the inhabitant. Savoy, Villa Savoy doesn't say anything about the Savoy family and the Falling Water building by Frank Lloyd Wright doesn't say anything about the you know, the owners, the Kaufman family. Well, this was not done by Sakakura, but by the artist. Now, the French-Japanese Institute in Tokyo, 1950, uh, drawing, uh, the drawing is very much uh, influenced by even the, the, the font of the letters, you know, come from Le Corbusier. Not bad, it's a good building. Sakakura was indeed one of the three, maybe more, but I, I read that the three fathers of modern architecture in Japan. I only know another, the other one, not the third one, Kunio Maekawa, about whom we talked some days ago. So again, this was built uh, more than 70 years ago. But if you build something like this today, it will still be appreciated as a contemporary uh, work of architecture. The City Hall in Hiraoki, Osaka, Japan, 1964. They loved concrete and they loved Le Corbusier. And you see here the influence of, uh, of the Swiss master. And we, you see also you know, the, the affection that the Japanese had after they were devastated by the Second World War for concrete and uh, in its brutalist mode, exposed concrete. The National Museum of Western Art, this is the one that Le Corbusier built, but Sakakura helped him, was a collaborator. So this is the work, the project of Le Corbusier, the only work done in, in um, East Asia and in, uh, in, in Japan. It's not an assuming work, it's not a dramatic work. It's a rather small museum. And as I said, Sakakura was in the team that made the project become reality, become a building.
the Museum of Western Art in Tokyo. Uh, Le Corbusier built another museum, but in Ahmedabad, in India. But he had uh, projects uh, and, uh, you know, he was preoccupied about the idea of a museum of art and he was, uh, in a strange way, uh, not very far away from what Google, for, for what uh, Frank Lloyd Wright did uh, in, in the Guggenheim Museum. In both cases, there was present a spiral, but in the case of Le Corbusier, was a, you know, a spiral uh, uh, governed by geometry that is uh, right angles, as opposed to the spiral movement present in the Guggenheim Museum. Here yeah, the spiral is not so obvious, but uh, there are studies and you can uh, find them on the web uh, of uh, even, you know, a museum with unlimited growth. You know, he, he studied the program, the museum, in almost idealistic uh, uh, ways, Le Corbusier, uh, sculpture by uh, the great, great, great French sculptor Auguste Rodin, the thinker. Possibly the most important work of Sakakura was the West Plaza of Shinjuku Station, today the busiest train station in the world. The plaza became famous also because of the protests that were staged here in the late 1960s and that brought to the fore the debate about the definition of public space in Japan. So this is the, uh, the work that I read about and uh, there are interesting, uh, more interesting pictures than this one. It's uh, yeah, a very busy urban place uh, you know, a lot of infrastructure, circulation, look at this, but it is uh, uh, even formally or aesthetically uh, accomplished and, and uh, impressive, Sakakura. Now, oh, I don't know why I show those works there, back to the station, if we are to call it station. We see some echoes here also from Le Corbusier again, uh, you know, this maybe they look like almost, uh, you know, giant uh, skylights at the bottom on the left corner and also in the back uh, here. But still the language, the architectural language of Sakakura is his own. Ichimura Memorial Gymnasium, 1961. Another good work by him. Again, you know, um, the, the, the exposed concrete that characterizes a lot of Japanese architecture from, from those years. Japan was trying to escape the, you know, the great shadow of the Second World War by asserting itself as a progressive country and its modernism in architecture expressed itself through exposed concrete, you know, um, the, denoting a sense of permanence, of solidity, of rigidity. I like very much this, um, this view of this uh, gymnasium. It's almost expressionistic somehow. Uh, this could have been a, a church seen from this angle. Inter-University Seminar House, Hachi Tokyo, 1964. Now look at this, 1964, an educational uh, building. It seems almost whimsical. It seems capricious. It seems, um, you know, almost a little bit irresponsible. But because we know very well that in some schools of architecture, this is, would be unacceptable. What do you mean? Slanted walls? How are you going to put the furniture there would be the, you know, the question. Well, obviously in Japan, uh, they don't have an issue with this. 
Sakakura, and it was, you know, more than 60 years ago. Is it interesting? Yes. Is it a little bit, uh, you know, idiosyncratic? Yes. But it's an interesting building. Why not um, acknowledge it as such? And you can see a lot of uh, indifference in a way towards the finishes of the building. It is an engaging building. You'll never forget it once you see it, they, even if you saw it in a, in a picture like, like we do now. Summer house in Karuizawa, 1962. In Japan, even the most radical architects never ever totally remove themselves from their past and from the rooting in their tradition. Interesting that the terrace on, on top of the roof, sloping roof. This reminds me of uh, you know some houses in uh, in the United States that are suggested in uh, Moby Dick's uh, Melville's uh, novel Moby Dick, where the the wives of the sailors would go on top of the roof on such terraces and contemplate the horizon to see if their husbands or brothers or sons return from their voyage, oftentimes a dangerous uh, voyage. Uh, University of the Arts. This is also an excellent building and reminding one a little bit of the Hiroshima Peace Memorial by Kenzo Tange. Uh, truly, the way they employ it, uh, concrete is very convincing. Unfortunately, for us today, as we know, concrete pollutes a lot. But um, uh, in terms of architectural expression, it is uh, very convincing, particularly when it is not hidden, you know, by so-called, um, you know, finishes. So it's a college of arts. Junzo Sakakura. Le Piloti, uh, another echo from Le Corbusier elevating the building and then underneath many many functions could take place sculptural vigorous honest what you see is what you get and here they are sakakura on the left le corbusier on the right again you know working for seven years for le corbusier was not a little thing Institute, the Institute um, uh, Franco-Japanese, uh, you know, French-Japanese in Tokyo. Look at those columns. I don't know if they were a little bit influenced by Frank Lloyd Wright's mushroom columns at um, Johnson Wax uh, complex of buildings in Wisconsin, the United States. They are a little bit different. But again, we see Sakakura being a very innovative and creative and uninhibited architect. As good architects should be. Hello, Mr. Sakakura. Now the Museum of Modern Art in Kamakura, the 1951. I imagine here is during the construction. But the, the manner of the drawing uh, makes me makes me feel, uh, you know, the, the influence of Le Corbusier. And even the building is, is in a way similar to the Museum of Western Art that Le Corbusier built and which uh, also received a contribution from Sakakura.
So he built this, uh, this building by himself without, um, without Le Corbusier. And as always, the attention to nature is, uh, is uh, very moving in, um, in, in Asia in general and in Japan in particular. It's not the garden in, 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 in Japan, it's not just a leftover, you know, uh, piece of work. No, it's never like this. Okay, so now we go to the uh, second presentation. Just a second, please.